Welcome to Russian History Retold, episode 140. How's he do it? Last time, we covered a brief history of the Crimea, from its early days in Greek history all the way up to present day, where we see uh, kind of a battle going on between Russia and Ukraine in 2014. What I want to do this episode, though, is tell you how I put on a Russian rulers or a Russian history retold podcast. I've been doing this for almost four years now. At the, on April 30th, we'll mark the fourth anniversary of the first episode. Can't believe it's gone this long. Uh, when I originally started this, I had about 52 episodes in mind. I was going to do it for just a year. I had it all mapped out and knew exactly what was going to happen. And of course, here we are at episode 140, uh, way far away from completing the history of Russia. Now, it's just the beauty that it's over a thousand years old, and it's just got so many more tales to tell, and I'm excited to be able to continue to do this. But people have wondered, you know, uh, there was a question on Facebook, how do you do it, Mark? How do you put together a podcast? Well, the first thing I do, since I'm no longer doing the rulers, which made it very easy because I just follow one ruler after another. Now I'm starting to pick and choose those topics that interest me and hopefully interest you, the listener. Uh, I look at different types of topics, things that are important in the social fabric of Russia and how it came about and how the people were like the ensurfment of the Russian peasant. also want to look at those monumental events like the Crimean War that were so important to what Russia is today. And I have to say the Crimean War, and you'll see this as we go on, why this war in 1854 to 1856 is driving the events of today in Crimea and why there was such an outpouring of people wanting to become part of Russia again and why Russia so desperately wanted the Crimea. We're going to be going over the battle at Sevastopol and why Here's Russia with the greatest defeat, but the greatest heroism in their hit and possibly their history at the siege of Sevastopol, and it was no longer Russian. So there was, you know, issues there. And I understand Ukrainian listeners, and I do understand your point of view as well, that there is something that was taken away from you. Both sides of the story, which is something that's important to me. I need to find more than one side of a story. Say, I'm going to use the example of this episode in the Crimean War. Or should I say this podcast series that's coming up on the Crimean War. Next episode, I'm going to tell you about my two primary sources for the information. One is Orlando Figg's book called, aptly enough, The Crimean War, A History. And the second one is by Trevor Royal. And it's also called Crimea, the Great Crimean War, 1854 to 1856. Now, I use these two books as my primary source, but not my solitary sources. Even when you have two books, you got to keep digging and digging deeper. I always go to one book because it's a scholarly work. It's one I actually had one of the early uh Editions, I think either first or second edition. It's called A History of Russia, and it was originally written by Nicholas V. Ryazanovsky, but later on, uh, Professor Mark Steinberg came on. And it's now in its eighth edition, and I think it's a primary source if you want to have information about Russian history. Is it flawless? Nope. No work of history is truly flawless. Is it one of the best there is? Yeah. Is it, though, a, an easy read where you get great stories? No, it's really history. It's the facts of what goes on. And it's very important for me to look at books like Figs, like Royals, and go into Ryazanovsky and Steinberg, two eminent professors in Russian history. Uh, <clears throat> one, Ryazanovsky, was a teacher at Berkeley, and Steinberg at the University of Illinois at uh, Urbana-Champaign. These are people who know the fact they teach the, the subject. They're fluent in the language, so they've been able to read original texts and continue to upgrade it. And I really recommend the, the eighth edition. 
A History of Russia uh, by Ryazanovsky and Steinberg. I also go to other ones. I have a very extensive library that I've built over the four years and longer because I've had a number of these books from back in my days in 1976 when I took Russian history with Dr. Paul Average at Queens College and the City University of New York. I look at uh, books by, say, Russia and the Russians, A History by Jeffrey Hosking. It's a very good work. I've found some errors in it, or let's put it this way, errors I believe are in the book. And I'm not going to go over them, but I did find a few that, you know, I didn't think that the way he looked at history was great, but it's a really nice large book. Again, it's a close to six, over 600 pages with lots of uh, references, which is also important. Uh, in my real job, I do research in the medical field and having references and doing things in a scholarly manner is very important to me in my profession. And I find it very important within my work as a podcaster because I could be very opinionated and put out a podcast that, you know, has my point of view only, but I really like to go in and find out what other people's points of view are. Another pretty good book, uh, it's called uh, Czars by James Duffy and Vincent Ricci. It's one of the inspirations for why I started this podcast. Uh, it's named Czars, Russia's Rulers for Over 1,000 Years. And it helped me with the early things and why I wanted to do Russian Rulers. I just found it an extremely fascinating book. A little light, because it's not a, you know, tremendously detailed book about all of history, so it's only in about 345 pages for a thousand-year history. It was a bit, little light, but still well-read, uh, excellent uh, writing in it. Another one by Philip Longworth, uh, which is Russia, the Once and Future Empire from Prehistory to Putin. Again, one of my original sources for the Russian Rulers podcast. Uh, the early history of Russia, really, from Rurik to about the time around Ivan the Fourth, you don't have a lot written. When Ivan the Terrible comes around, well, he's a very popular subject, so he had a lot of books about him. And I have about four on Ivan the uh, Terrible himself. Uh, so I had to go back and forth and look at the different books and see who had what written about him. Uh, then I start going into some other books. Uh, I do have the Encyclopedia of Russian History, which is well over, hard to say, over $1,000. Uh, so some of these books are not inexpensive, but it has tidbits on every part of Russian history from the beginning and to, to so many of the details that I didn't even know existed, had not seen in any other book. It does have some problems in it. It has a tinge of prejudice from the communist era, so it has a lot of the Soviet influence, I believe, on history because it was written by Russians. And if it's been written recently, they would have lived under Soviet uh, rule likely to have lived, or at least the remnants of it. So there's a little bit of prejudice there, but it's great for some fact checking. And again, I do this quite a bit. Uh, another one that I like to do is I like to read original writings from Russia and translate it, obviously, because I don't read Russian. Uh, sorry to say that it was something that my mother uh, did not have me do as a child. I uh, feel saddened about it that they, because they were immigrants and uh, they didn't want me to rely on the old languages, they wanted me to really get into English. This was very important to them personally. Uh, one is the books I use is called Reinterpreting Russian History Readings 860 to 1860s, compiled and edited by Daniel. Kaiser and Gary Marker. It has a lot of different uh, things coming from the time, like letters from uh, Kerbsky, Prince Kerbsky to Ivan uh, the Terrible. Uh, it's got things about Russian literature that were written. Uh, it has a marriage contract from 1668 in the book. Uh, in, uh, information about law and ensurfment of the Russian peasantry, which I used to look into that. It has writings about the seclusion of uh, Muscovite women in the early 16 and 1500s. So it's an important one to get that into it, to look at the cultural side of it and look at it from the point of view of the people of the time, because quite often we don't do that. We look at it with beautiful foresight. And they say that 
Foresight is 2020, but I disagree with that. I think it gets muddled. I think we're more like 2200 when we look back. And the further back we look into Russian history, the worse off the vision of what happened. So it's important to read about them. Another book that gives me some ideas about what's going on with the people is a very important one, I thought, called Women in Russian History from the 10th to the 20th Century by Natalie uh, Pushkareva, and it was uh, translated, Russian, originally Russian work, translated by Eve uh, Levin. A very important book, tells me quite a bit about the women, which I think is also not very well covered. I, I know I haven't covered it very well, and I intend on changing that in the future, that I want to cover how women were seen in Russian history and their place in society, and I think that's something very important. Uh, having said that, also, there's another beautiful book that has looks into the people, which I think is also very important. It's called Natasha's Dance, A Cultural History of Russia. It's by Orlando Figs. I love this guy's work. I mean, he wrote The People's Tragedy about the Russian Revolution, another book I have, and I intend on covering that more in depth. I want to cover the tragedy of the Russian Revolution and the Russian Civil War. Uh, I really kind of glossed over it in my times about Lenin, but I think it's an important uh, subject, and Orlando Figgs does a beautiful job of it as well. I have some other interesting books here. I've, uh, Robert Service's uh, work called A History of Modern Russia from Tsarism to 21st Century. This was more recent when I was doing the work on the Soviet Union. Uh, when I did The Russian Rebels, I really relied on one book as my master source, and it was by my professor, Dr. Paul Average. It's called Russian Rebels, 1600 to 1800, Four Great Rebellions Which Shook the Russian State in the 17th and 18th Centuries. If you're wondering, it's not average, as an average of numbers, but it's Paul Average, A-V-R-I-C-H. He was a, quite a prolific writer, and I'm very sad that he passed away before he could have heard that one of his students, you know, felt inspired enough by him to uh, do this podcast and to bring Russian history to the world. Uh, Paul wrote quite a number of books, many of them on the subject of anarchism, uh, the Haymarket trial and the Haymarket uh, explosion in the United States. He wrote a whole book on that and a number of others on the different anarchists, and he had a very different way of looking at them. He didn't have them pigeonholed into this knife-in-the-mouth, bomb-in-each-hand, Molotov cocktail-making anarchist who wanted to blow up the world. He had more interviews with anarchists than any other man in the world, and they're in the Library of Congress, from what I understand. He gave all his writings to them, and he viewed them as some of the most peaceful people. I remember a comment by him in college. It's amazing that I still remember this uh, 38 years later. He said he remembered a number of anarchists that if they came upon a cockroach would walk around it instead of stepping on it because they believe so much in the sanctity of life. This was very different from the anarchists we hear about, you know, that they want to kill people, blow up institutions, where some do, of course. I mean, Emma Goldman was one. Uh, the one who assassinated McKinley was another. His name I can't even think about pronouncing. But there's a number of those like that. But th for the predominant number of anarchists, especially Russian anarchists like Peter Kropotkin, peaceful change was more in light. There will be another one that I'm going to be discussing, which is Nestor Makhno, who has uh, worked with Lenin and the Red Army to defeat the Tsars, and then was, of course, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, he was kind of lied to and then you know, killed by the Red Army itself when they got rid of him and didn't need him anymore, whereas you said gone away. So we have that, you know, he was a pretty violent man as well. But anything on anarchism, and especially Russian anarchism, look for Professor Paul Average's books. There are a number of good ones there. I have most of them. When I did the uh, Grigory uh, Rasputin era and his life, one of the books that I used, because I want to, I, one of the listeners, I want to thank him, and his name escapes me right now, but you know who you are, told me about Margarita uh, Nalipa, who had written uh, this book called The Murder of Grigory Rasputin, a conspiracy that brought down the Russian Empire. 
really well, you know, written. I think there's some holes in it. I could have done a little better. But as a whole, it was really nice to see a different point of view about Grigory Rasputin. And of course, I went to all my other sources, the Ryazanovsky Steinberg book. I went to Orlando Figgs' books, Hoskings in Russian History, the Tsar's books about Rasputin. And this was very different. You know, it's it's interesting to see there was a difference. And that's why I presented that uh, when I did the Alexander the First uh, material. There was also a couple of other books that I used. I used the book Imperial Legend, The Mysterious Disappearance of Tsar Alexander I by Alexis Trubutskoy. It was a very different point of view, somewhat similar to Margarita Nalipa's book on Rasputin. This gave a different point of view of what happened to Alexander. If you read the traditional uh, textbooks, Alexander I died. There was no question. He died in Tagenrog. Finished. End of story. Trubitskoy puts out a different point of view, which is what I love about history. Look at things that are not what you think they are. Try to dig deeper. Try to find new things. And I hope that's what I've been doing for all of you. One of my oldest books I've used, and again, going back to the uh, sort of reading from the original material from medieval Russia and the old times, is a book called Medieval Russia's Epics, Chronicles, and Tales. It's edited by Serge Zenkovsky. And it's another one where we have lots of different stories. Sviatoslav's early campaigns, the siege of Kiev, and Olga's death, Vladimir Monomak, instruction to his children, tale of the life and courage of the pious and great prince Alexander Nevsky, and so on. So lots of great stuff. It's first published in 1963. Uh, still good today. Uh, I think it's, it's an excellent read and something if you want to learn more about medieval Russia couple other books I want to tell you about before we end the podcast ones. A Brief History of Russia by Michael Court. Again, I found errors in it, things I did not like. But if you want a quick read going through Russia, as it says, A Brief History, it's well worth picking up. Another one that I used in, from the beginning, it's called The Romanovs by Lindsay Hughes, Ruling Russia, 1613 to 1917. A pretty good book, light, but if you want something easy to read and quick, that's one I would recommend. And another one I would uh, really recommend by Susan Massey. As it is the wife of Robert Massey, the great uh, writer of history uh, books. It's called Land of the Firebird, The Beauty of Old Russia. Nice big piece of work. So you may also be asking me, how do you buy all these books? First thing I gotta tell you, and I know this is not gonna make the publishers happy, I start with used books. I can get great discounts on some of them. Uh, to build up a, a library like this takes some time in doing. And since it takes me so long to do a podcast, you know, it, it's I can't just go to the library and keep renewing the book. It just doesn't work that way. I have to own it so I can put little notes into it. And so let's go into the making of this podcast. The software I use is called Propaganda, and I am going to be changing that. They're not supporting it anymore from what I can see. Uh, so as soon as I can, I'm going to be upgrading it to a different recording studio. Uh, I do invest in a pretty good microphone and a uh, pop screen in front. That uh, was one of my early listeners told me, better get one because it will make a big difference in the quality. I do this in a, in a little office I have in my home. Uh, so when I start this, I pick a topic. And then I try to write an overview of where I want it to go, just basically an outline. And I use pen and paper. Uh, I know it's a little old fashioned, but I'm old school. Uh, from there, I typically begin to write my script. I have my books in front of me. I start looking at them. I write the script up. And usually I look at it, about 15 pages of handwriting. Uh, part of my big problem is I look at my handwriting and not so great and sometimes I wonder what in the world did you write? So then I type it into the computer, into Microsoft Word, and then I print it. And then I begin the editing of it. I begin to look at the books. I begin to look at what have I written? Does it make sense? Uh, does it follow any, you know, just system, systematic presentation of things? And then I go on. And when I'm happy with it, I do all the editing, print it up again after I've done it, 
and then I bring it over to the little studio I have here on this desk, and I begin to read it. And sometimes I go off script. You may even sometimes notice I, I bring in opinions on things. If I see something fresh that just pops into my head at the time of writing, or the type of reading time that I have on the podcast, we go through it, and then when I'm happy and I think everything's right, I then render it and upload it to uh, Russian Rulers History uh, dot podhoster dot com. I use used Podhoster since the beginning for four years. I find them, you know, pretty good. They have good statistics. It takes a little longer because uh, I've been around a long time. I am their feature podcaster and have been for quite a while. Uh, it does cost about forty dollars a month to keep the podcast up on uh, online. But I think it's worth it, and I want to tell you that's why I really appreciate it when I get donations anywhere from a dollar, and I've had a, donations of a hundred dollars, which really helped out, because month after month it does does add up. I mean, it's five hundred dollars a year about just to keep the podcast online, uh, and then the books probably somewhere between about five hundred to a thousand dollars a year. So not inexpensive to do this, but it is something that I appreciate. Uh, doing i love it and i'm so happy that i have so many listeners out there uh i've had over 3.3 million downloads of this podcast which if you had told me that in the beginning i would have laughed at you i said there's no way it could get that many but over the years it's gotten that way and i want to thank all of you for listening to this podcast and hope you really enjoy what i gave you today and how i do this little podcast here in uh, Reno, Nevada, is where I'm based out of. I'm originally from New York City, uh, by way of Germany and St. Petersburg, Russia, where my Russian side of the family comes from. And here I am in America, giving all of you what I think is one of the most beautiful and rich histories of all time, Russia. So, as always, до свидания и спасибо большое.